yeah, I think that's great. Absolutely. Cool. Well, we can probably jump right in. Um, the opening and announcements and stuff. I don't really have any announcements. We just had all of our all of our Earth Day festivities, so it's been super crazy for us for the past few weeks um, in all of our all of our offices. Um, Tamara, Tamara, oh, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, as many of you do know, I'm involved with the Blue Hill Observatory and Science Center here in Massachusetts. And they've, the building has been undergoing renovation for the um, past year and a half. Um, it's a historical monument and it had to go under very, building was leaking and so it had to go undergo renovation. Anyway, they're having a grand reopening in July. And if anybody is in the Boston area and would like to go, I just let me know and I will send you the invitation. So just want to make people aware of that. Caroline, do you mind if I go? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be facilitating. Go ahead. <laughs> I wasn't sure who, I was just, I'm just, you know, I get you. Um, so uh, I put in the chat, uh, we have our second public climate literacy session, but I think this is the fifth, because there's been a lot behind the scenes. Um, today at three o'clock, uh, we have a couple others that are scheduled um, that are general. If anybody wants to partner with us to have a focus on a different topic, like higher education, workforce development, we're still working on some of these as well, but um, we have some regional ones that are not going to be public like uh, Mid-Atlantic, uh, maybe Midwest and um, California. There's other our options. Carolyn, if Florida wanted to have a regional, uh, you know, uh, climate literacy session, we'd be happy to partner with any organization. Um, and uh, they are, they, we're getting very different answers than we did in 2008-9, so, uh, which we would expect. But the key to helping us make the best version of this document possible is if a public listening session comments are robust, meaning please show up and say what you must say. It's the fastest way to do it or to send them in as written comments. But uh, the more we do this, the more we have to represent that in the guide that gets approved by the heads of global change research across 14 departments and agencies in the U.S. government. Sorry, that was a lot to say in one breath. Um, anyway, uh, show up, say a lot, get others to show up, say a lot. It'll help us get the best version possible. Uh, Karen, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make everybody aware that next Tuesday's session is going to be a follow-up to the January 24th discussion that, that Frank facilitated um, about workforce development. We're going to have uh, a, a man from the Rising Sun Opportunities Group out in California that has a, a incredibly uh, robust and uh, diverse operation going in California that could serve as a model for others around the country. Uh, to kick us off, and then we're going to extend that conversation about workforce development and what all of our organizations um, can and should be doing to move towards the electrification of the country. So it should be a great session. Yeah, Sorry, I was just going to say thanks. Karen's been really leading organizing that. So I appreciate that um, help <laughs> getting your schedule filled with good stuff. Karen, just to be clear, the, the thing that's in the chat is what you're referring to? 
the additional it's an additional event or are you talking about the clean weekly one sorry i lost the I'm detail. talking about i'm talking about the regular clean session at this time next week gotcha okay kurt different different than um your session but but it also looks like Gina's got something else that she's talking about. So there's a third thing we're talking about. No, so, no, yeah. Gina's talking about the one that I just mentioned. Oh. I think. Because we've I been working two, with Gina to schedule it. I put two things in the chat. Or I'm talking, oh, okay. but it's fine. Obviously, have, I have not looked at the chat. <laughs> we have a, a great session during this time next week that Karen has helped organize has organized and then i have my hand raised because uh clean is doing um a screening for a um uh it's like a movie documentary type mm -hmm. um type video uh that we're partnering with the renee crown institute in colorado and uh the climate mental health network um that's following stories um, about Gen Z and how they deal with climate change and mental health. So that's coming in May because May is uh, mental health month. So we're gonna be doing a big push on uh, lots of mental health resources. Uh, I'll probably mention that, but that is coming in May. And the date for that one? Um, uh, May 17th. That's the May 17th, okay. So you're right, Frank, three different things. <laughs> a, we're busy people. There's a lot going on. All right. Um, anyone, anyone else before I sort of uh, fire up my PDF here? All righty then. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the impact of citizen science, um, community, you know, community science projects when it comes to, you know, engagement and climate in particular. Um, I got these slides from SciStarter, which is a really great organization if you're not already familiar with them, just kind of why it's important. So I, I recognize that I'm probably, you know, talking to a more informed audience than usual, but, you know, what sort of what comes to what comes to mind when you hear citizen science. And this is it's just us guys like go ahead just unmute yourself and talk um, so I don't have to try to toggle back and forth and see who's got their hand up. Carolyn, I used to do this with NASA quite quite a bit when I did land remote sensing work. So, um, you know, obviously it's a partnership between scientists. Um, usually, when I did it, it, was partnerships between scientists and educators and and young people. Um, but but ultimately, they're doing science, which has some special uh, requirements. Um, not learning about science, but actually doing science. So that's that's kind of the simplest way I think about it. Absolutely. I, I apologize. This is probably going to be very basic for you um, in terms no, 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 of, no. but it's such an important piece of the work. So uh, don't, don't, don't go there, please. Okay. And in, in my experience, it has primarily been asking citizens to collect on the ground data. Yeah. Um, and in more recent years, I think people have become more sophisticated about engaging more elements of the scientific endeavor in the citizen science process. 
I, I agree, Karen. I think that the collecting data has historically been the um, main piece of that, but I think an important and probably growing element is communicating what they found to others, even if they don't do an in-depth analysis, but being, because that gives them exercise in, in reading and graphs and data on maps. And, and it's something I can tell you my college students are very poor at. So um, it's something that would be, it is really helpful. I'll tell you one, one discipline, not climate related, but one discipline that is huge into this is astronomy. The amateur astronomy community is huge and they are, in, they are engaged in terms of collecting data when events, particular events happen. So there's probably something to learn from that community in terms of how to engage people in it more fully. Yeah, I would say it's astronomy and ecology is also very big into this. You know, there, there, Carolyn, at NOAA, we have a robust citizen science case. So it's been weird, horrible. But um, the one of the areas that has uh, shown up a lot recently is where um, data interpretation by, by community members where we have huge data sets where we don't have enough people looking at and interpreting the data to find patterns, find signals, find issues, um, reveal things. Uh, I know that's been used in um, astronomy often, but the Earth's uh, data sets have also similar issues as well. So i um, trying to remember there was one, one data set that was really powerful in interpreting some, um, you know, climate modeling outputs or something like that, where they needed interpretation um, to really uh, add value. So I've seen that or like, you know, there's a lot of um, paleoclimatology where, where data cores were collected, but never analyzed. Huge amounts of unanalyzed uh, data has been collected. So, you know, there, I've seen that as well. Yeah, I've seen one in, in particular where people are sort of looking at photos of coral reefs and, you know, marking, you know, marking different species or where they see bleaching and sort of highlighting it for, um, you know, I'm not sure if it's like a computer program or scientists look at it, but yeah, doing that like preliminary sort of analysis and manipulation. Mentioning uh, if I might mention, um, just to, you know, these are examples that you probably all are aware of, but, um, you know, to put on the table, uh, current projects that are fairly popular around the country, uh, heat island mapping, especially that started in, in, uh, in Boston and is now spread. I've been asked to, to bring that into California, you know, what we can share in California, uh, monitoring CO2 levels, um, air pollution in general, or, you know, other particular particulates, uh, related water, uh, air quality, water quality. Um, then also uh, looking at changes in the annual cycles of anim animals and plants or where species are showing up. So where, you know, these, these are some of the popular things that I think are very effective. Um, certainly, I mean, throwing those out as a few there. I'd like to put into somewhere in the discussion here um, as well, how we feel as a group of, should we keep this frame on citizen science to that? Um, at least to recognize something that overlaps with it, and that is, it could be, you know, would we call it citizen STEM action, community action, but it's, but there's a difference between collecting data and seeing, gee, it's real, climate change is real, and it's really doing what we've been projecting it would do in, in this, and ways in which you're doing science and engineering where, where you're making a difference to, to Make a make a positive difference to uh, minimize the effect of climate change, whether it be by mitigation or I mean, it's essentially, and that's something to, you know. Essentially, it, it's ways in which people are taking action, not just we're monitoring and watching what will happen. Um, and by the way, I would also say on that to, to uh, Tamara's point of of uh, when they collect, what how are they persuasive with that information? And I can give some examples of how. Very exciting that is, and that gets teachers going in a, in a big way. But anyway, th throwing out some points, and I'll be quiet now. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I mean, if y'all um, remember the 
and I guess I can drop the link again um, if this session is for my self-aggrandizement, but the paper that just came out last month that my colleague and I wrote literally was that. It was people who were students, you know, who were collecting data and doing some basic analysis and then presenting it to, you know, city county commissions and talking about the, you know, the implications of what they found and you know, how they wanted to address the issues that they were seeing highlighted by the day they, they collected. So I think we're all familiar enough to know exactly what this, you know, what this term means. Um, a really big thing for me, um, and this is something that I ended up covering quite a bit when I was in grad school for STEM education, is that a lot of people, um, particularly people who are underrepresented in STEM fields, they don't necessarily see scientists who, you know, look like them, talk like them, come from a similar background as them, and they can often perceive science as something like separate from them, separate from their lives, something that other people do. You know, they're not, they're, they're not qualified to be a scientist. You know, they're just passively receiving information out of a textbook. And that, you know, kind of fuels some of the alienation we see from science and STEM fields, which can also end up leading to distrust in these communities. Um, you know, if you don't if you've never been welcomed into the scientific world and you don't have a robust, um, a robust science education, uh, then when someone is explaining why, no, actually, you know, that like that person on the internet was wrong and it's um, actually these vaccines weren't developed too quickly to be safe um, and this is why you should take them, you know, they're not necessarily going to have that background. So I think it's really important, not only um, for the advancement of science itself and for, you know, for like sort of community issues, but I think this is also really important when it comes to um, like public trust in science. If people have been part of the scientific process, they're a lot more likely to understand the value of the scientific process and of science itself. So we're, you know, we're not necessarily going to go through all the cute little, uh, you know, the cute little practice demos, but here's, an, um, here's just one example. And so this one was, you know, helping city planners to research invasive tree species. So here are just a couple of examples of various um, accomplishments that have come out of citizen science-based studies. Uh, and so, yeah, this, this definitely tracks with what y'all were saying about the fields that are most heavily, um, you know, most heavily into this because we're seeing mainly, you know, astronomy and ecology. Uh, and in my experience, that has been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the best ways to get people involved. Uh, here talking about, you know, that data that hasn't been analyzed. We've got all of these, you know, all of these pictures and people, you know, looking for, looking for patterns. Um, another really great thing about citizen science is that usually if you sign up, um, you're on some kind of email list and you'll hear you know, later on about the results of the studies that you help to, that you help to support. And again, that's, that's getting people more involved in science, caring, you know, under, seeing and understanding that their contributions have made, you know, a tangible difference. And that is really important to get people to, again, feel connected to the scientific process. You know, and then you know, whether it's kids talking about going into STEM fields or, you know, if these are adults and, you know, some initiative or other comes up where they have to decide on, you know, how much money that they want dedicated to science funding. You know, they're gonna feel a lot more connected to the process and more motivated to think that that's a good priority for society. Um, there would be a thing of, uh, 
an, an example of organizations that do STEM or science more broadly, you know, there's the thing of having things that are climate focused and thing and then connecting with the ones that are more broadly connected. Uh, definitely, I've seen the organizations that are in that broader category are very interested now in doing things more on climate action. And for instance, tomorrow I'll be meeting again with the uh, um, CID, uh, Chief Science Officers Program, which is quite large in many states and across the country. They would like to do that, and they're set up to do to really work with uh, students on a lot of areas. So they they would like to work with uh, action. Of course, I'm one of the things I always bring up is we need got to get you into the clean network, right? And and let's let's be working together on that. So it's recognizing the. Um, the, the connection with it. I think there's also uh, a difference of how different people are going to handle this. Um, having worked with Turk and the STEM for All Video Showcase, we work with a lot of the, uh, the programs that do action, uh, uh, youth action on, on various points. And what we were finding a lot is uh, programs that communicate with government. And then what do you do when you're ignored or when you find out that the government is actually just promising things and has no intention of actually doing that. I mean, that is a gigantic problem with climate action plans. And I think we can either be part of those that get kind of just rah, 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 we're doing great, we've got a plan. And the difference between just because politicians promise something, that's not the same thing as action. If you don't mind, I'll give you an example. I know Oakland the best, but California in general. Oakland now is on its second climate action plan. The first one from 2010 to 2020 was one of the earliest ones and within months they had abandoned it when they sold it it was we're doing all these wonderful things we're going to promise all these things and and then the summation of why did they abandon it is because it was too uh ambitious so the politicians had promised the world and then used the fact that they promised the world to say we're not going to do anything in 2020 and then they're doing the same thing again so how do the young people use citizen science or looking at things to point out we want to hold you to what you promised we're going to look at what you did we're going to look at different things and if i give one more more pleasant example is frank i'm sorry i never followed up with you on the human origins exhibit but specifically with the natural history museum where i will be back i'm going to be in dc again in a very short while we have have we have a great relation with the Natural History Museum because we teach climate science on the floor of the museum, right, with them, right? And we go around the NOAA exhibits and we show off the NOAA exhibits and things and take people around with the cameras on energy surveys. But we encountered with the Human Origins exhibit that they are stuck on having all these incandescent lights lighting up exhibits about climate change, right? Because the federal government sets up its budget so that you have your exhibits money, right? Who has money to just maintain and do things and then you have the people pay the energy bill and those are two separate budgets and so they're wasting money on uh, incandescent lighting and instead of saving money by let's replace it with leds which will save us money well but that's not the exhibit department's money so they continue to waste money and they continue to pay because it's just like well that's what our energy bill costs and things like that our students are learning well that means we go up higher into the smithsonian we go we go to the white house we bring you know this thing of how do how do we communicate we take an attitude of we're going to find a solution to this that's crazy that's kind of doesn't surprise that the federal government has operations like that but this is a chance to to you know to not just give up anyway some things of being engaged in the difference between uh, climate policy and climate action and, and things is a great learning experience and the students can do some pretty exciting things. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, and I, uh, I apologize um, that the maintenance workers are currently uh, weed whacking outside my apartment. If you hear any background noise um, and it's super distracting, let me know. No, no, no problem. Uh, uh, Carolyn, do you mind if I respond to Jim and then just make a quick point? Yeah, no, absolutely. Please go for it. So, Jim, I just put the um, Smithsonian Institution's Climate Action Plan from August 13th of 2021 in the uh, chat. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's that's a plan that they're to be held accountable to. But I think you're opening up an interesting new space in citizen science which is that, you know, like, are, 
are we actually on track to doing what we said? So like external validity, right? Like, you know, we said we were going to do this, but where are we on it? And without them taking like, oh, we're, we're, we're all over it. And like, hmm, well, well, we have the ability to independently verify. And that's an interesting point that I think aligns up both citizen science type of activities and climate action in a way that I don't know if I've seen done. So that's an interesting point. But it also raises a second point, um, Carolyn, in this conversation I've been I've been part of for quite some time, and that is the term citizen science. Citizen is a very problematic word um, inside this country. There are a lot of community members that are not citizens who are legally totally available to be part of community. But for whatever reason, community science has not overtaken citizen science. So there's just a but there is a real problem because we have members of other nations legally allowed to be part of this, especially indigenous nations. We have 573 federally recognized nations inside the United States nation that are a part of our communities, but they're not, they're not in, they're not citizens, at least not citizens of this nation. So, um, you know, that, that term, I'm not sure where we are on that term. I know it's been kicked around a lot and it's, it's deeply problematic. So, um, but anyway, I think, I, I think there are two points there. I was, I was, I would have my hand up for the original one, but Jim, your point about, you know, external validity, I think is really valuable. Yeah. I think it's just like, like, I mean, it's, it's partially inertia that when you say citizen science, people kind of know what you're talking about versus community science, you know, it's, it's newer. And also like it's it, citizen science is just, it's alliterative and it's more catchy. So, um, but no, I totally, I totally agree. Um, I know that, you know, there are issues with the term. It's just, yeah, that's still kind of for now the prevailing word in the field. So, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. You're, you're absolutely right. And it's something to work on. And I just wanted to add to that. I've heard that too, Frank, and you know, that the, you know, the discussion with citizen using the term citizen. And then I've also heard it turn um, rephrase as using it, you're the citizen of this planet. And so I've heard of reframing it too. So I just think it's an interesting, I mean, we kind of all need to lean in one direction, how we're going to frame it and, and talk about it um, in order to be consistent. But yeah, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. I mean, that's definitely how I think about it is like, when I think about citizens of my community, that has nothing to do with like their legal status, you know, to me, that's like, if you're, you know, here and you work here and your kids go to school and you're contributing to, you know, you're contributing to the fabric of our community, then you're a citizen. But yeah, I know that on a more technical level that it absolutely can be a loaded term. And Carolyn, especially for the indigenous populations. Um, it is a very, and, and that, that we don't think about our tribal and indigenous members of our communities um, and the legal rights based status that they have um, enough. Uh, it's a blind spot often. So it's, it, you know, usually the ones who've helped me, encouraged me, I don't know what the right word is, probably <laughs> something stronger than encouraged. Um, to consider not using words that come from that citizen-based uh, word. Um, but, uh, you know, it is definitely an issue. There's also amateur science, community science, crowdsource science, volunteer science, volunteer monitoring, pr public participation in scientific research. I mean, yeah. SciStarter has a whole page about this, right? So, you know, but it's, I just put it out there as a, as a, a consideration as we have this conversation. So, you know, I understand the, I understand the vibe. I, I can't say that I really like the term amateur science because I feel like it, it sounds a little bit dismissive. But, you know, the whole goal is that anyone with or without any kind of training, you know, can take part in this one. And so, you know, just kind of promoting different kinds of organizations. Um, SciStarter, it's not, SciStarter is not one project. It's, you know, it's kind of like the clean network in that regard where it's, you know, it compiles different, um, 
you know, different projects from all over the world. Uh, a lot of them are virtual opportunities um, or you might find things, you know, by your geographic area. So if you register, then you'll find, you know, all different kinds of opportunities and plenty of them. Uh, plenty of them are linked to climate. So if you want something that is more specifically about climate, you can do that. Easy to create an account. There you go, seasonal variation um, by counting arthropods and documenting pollinators. You know, all of these things are heavily linked to, you know, heavily linked to climate and changing seasonal patterns. Um, they have a lot of, like a lot of events and a lot of resources for educators. And this is kind of more along the lines of convincing educators, um, you know, that this is something you know, viable that should spend their time on um, all of these transferable process skills that come out of, you know, again, not just learning from a textbook, learning, you know, sort of what already exists as canon, but, you know, really being part of the scientific process of generating new knowledge. And when it comes to, again, like getting kids interested, um, in particular kids, because, you know, we're here primarily um, as educators, it is just such a powerful tool. I just enjoy the phrase project squirrel. So I can send this PDF to anyone who might be interested. Um, and these are just giving different examples. Uh, a lot of libraries are acting as hubs for citizen science. So if any of your organizations want to, if, you know, if you work at a museum um, or any kind of science education, you know, place, then you can, um, you can get this started, or you could partner, you know, partner with a library. Um, my local library has an air quality monitor that you can, you know, that you can check out. So they have different ways to help you gather information. You know, benefits both the citizens, the scientists, and the community um, address issues that you're curious or concerned about. Um, and I'll, um, I'll drop it in the I'll drop it in the chat. Um, let's see, how do I? Because yeah, with what what James, um, James what you were talking about, um, is, you know, bringing this sort of citizen science into into action is, you know, the basis of the project that we just did. Let's see if I can find the PDF of it. Oh, Carolyn, and I wanted to mention this for Frank. This is something I was going to be bringing up a little bit late, you know, in weeks ahead or something, you know, when we encounter a new organization or newly. But this is, a, I think, a very encouraging development to, to note. Um, of course, Department of Energy, we have the, the national laboratories. And in the Bay Area, we have two. And it kind of Sandy actually shows up as the third, but Berkeley and Livermore. We just did a science festival with uh, a group called Quest, I'll put in a link, at, based out of Livermore. But what really stood out about this is mostly it is retired scientists and engineers at Lawrence Livermore Lab, and they're very well organized, and they're very into climate, and they're, I mean, very active. They're putting a science festival. They're looking into whether they're going to have a, a science center, but uh, it, they're very much on this. We, we're going to do science. And I can't thank you enough on the point you were making about citizen, right? That is. It is, it is such a it that's so we really have to triple underline that and get that uh but on the sign on the science done by ordinary people about young people and retired people anyway a, a great development to see a federal agency the retired people becoming volunteers in climate action i just it, I, it, we'll be hearing from them i'm, I'm gonna insist that they join the clean network but i, I think we could be seeing more of that thank you So they've got, you know, fun little badges and things. Um, again, I can uh, I can share that presentation um, if anyone's interested. Clio did a project last year, and we have been sort of uh, we have been expanding it um, because we just had uh, we just had our community resilience manager down in Miami working with some folks, um, not students, just members of the members of the community uh, monitoring air pollution after, if y'all heard of the Doral incinerator fire. 
So they were in the area and again, monitoring air quality and pollution and, you know, bringing that to the attention of city officials who were, as you can imagine, trying to kind of sweep things under the rug. Um, so, you know, sort of like real time on the ground monitoring there. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, if someone else is running a project, you, you know, can't necessarily just kind of do whatever with the data, but, you know, if you start one or if you're sort of collaborating and planning that from the beginning, um, then yeah, that's also a really, a really great way to launch into, you know, civic engagement and advocacy. Um, and again, that's something that we covered in our article about, you know, the link between air quality and, you know, human health and, um, you know, basically, you know, environmental, environmental racism. I know we're not allowed to say that here in Florida, but uh, yeah, making, making those links. And I found a couple other links that I'm just going to drop into the chat about various sort of areas where, um, that, that have similar, you know, similar collections of resources and projects. Um, National Geographic has a has a great one, and the Globe Obser Observer Program, which it's with NOAA. So Frank, I'm sure you're you're well aware of it already. But um, Frank has his hand up, and other Frank. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to stop talking and let somebody else go. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really kind of excited that the R word has showed up to, at least twice so far. With uh, R word being retired, uh, I saw that in your slides. Uh, Jim, I appreciate, I want to find out more about the group that you were talking about, Lawrence Livermore. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that that's um, looking at some of the groups that I've been involved with where the average age is such that there's lots of gray hairs floating around um, and people saying, well, what can we do? And then seeing the emergence of groups like uh, uh, rise the retirees in service to to the environment and and second and uh, no what is it third wave it, it just seems like there's a tremendous about a possibility here and I one of the things I'm really curious about is um, where there are instances or examples of retirees working with school kids. Frank, you're muted. We tried to do that in the GLOBE program. Thank you, Frank. Um, thank you for, you know, Frank's got to stick together. Um, the uh, We tried to do that in the GLOBE program because one of the biggest challenges with a lot of, especially the Earth data, uh, is keeping continuous, right? So when you're working with schools um, and as, as part of this, um, summers and holidays become really problematic. And so that that, that partnership between retired community members and and schools um, became, you know, as an interesting place to look at it. Because I mean, ultimately, it's about data continuity, right? But there's another important point that you alluded to, Frank, that, that I really want to emphasize, and I think, Jim, you got into this, is, is the democracy of data. Because the uh, whose data is it? Because if there's environmental problems, not everybody wants everyone to know about those problems. And so, you know, if air quality issues in communities um, can be documented or water quality issues can be documented um, by the community for the community, um, it gives them leverage over the people who are supposed to be protecting those resources. So, you know, th this is a lot of where uh, some of this, this community citizen, you know, uh, data comes from is like, we're going to, we have our own data and we see an issue um, that you don't see. And you must, but if it had that, this is where the science comes in because of its quality, it's indefutable, indefutable, irreputable. You know what I mean? Uh, I, my brain is shot. Um, it's Tuesday and it's already shot. That's supposed to happen around Thursday afternoon. So clearly it's been busy. Um, so anyway, but you, you get my point that, that the whose data it is, but again, science has to, is all about quality calibration. I've never, the, I remember the, the spending hours calibrating thermometers in the GLOW program, um, you know, 
not everyone knows you have to calibrate your thermometers. Um, thermometers are thermometers, right? But they still have to be calibrated. And so if you have accurate data, you've done certain things that make the quality go up and the irrefutability uh, become, you know, uh, you know, not an issue. So um, it's a really important uh, space in a community context, for sure. If I could throw one more quick thing in here, if anybody has, uh, if anybody is aware of websites, documents, et cetera, that document what um, retire, retired folks are doing in the realm of community science, this would be really useful. Um, we've got a neighborhood village here that uh, there is a, um, group of folks that probably would really jump at the chance to do this kind of thing, but we need some concrete things to be able to put in their laps. I don't know of any off the top of my head, but you can definitely, um, you know, look through some of the, you know, some of the links and for, you know, for some of them, for a lot of them, probably have contact forms. So, you know, if there's a project you're interested in, um, you might be able to sort of reach out to whoever's running it and ask them to, you know, either come talk to folks, even if this, even if they don't have evidence of people, like retired people already doing it. If you could say, hey, could you hop on Zoom for half an hour and explain your project to these folks and ask them for their help? I, I can't imagine that most people, even if they, you know, even if they don't necessarily have the capacity for that, like nobody's going to be hostile about it. Um, also, for Frank and Frank G, um, there's <laughs> there's a, a program that contacted me at some point, and it, it, we probably both want to follow up on them and how they're doing out of Cornell, which was specifically to uh, encourage uh, retired people to consider action in climate change. So they were they were getting interviews and, and looking to do that. I mean, I was really applauding. It's time we need we do that but to see where where's that going. I'll put in I'll put in a contact information for you. Yeah, that's the Rise program. And yeah, um, yeah you got it. I'm, I'm the na Northeast Neighborhood Northeast Village PDX contact for Rise. So yeah, they're, they're pretty familiar with these folks doing lots of good stuff. Great, and they're sticking with it. That's what I wanna hear. Sticking with it, and uh, as you're talking, one of the things that seems like a, a dynamite possibility is that they're from Cornell, which is the same place that PRI and Don Haas and that whole crew is coming out of. Um, also at Cornell, um, if you're familiar with the Civic Ecology Lab, they do a lot of, you know, sort of professional development type courses around, yeah, the intersection of, you know, like social justice and, you know, communities and, you know, ecology and climate. So, um, you know, anyone's welcome in those courses and they can talk about you know, talk about things they've done. So reach out to maybe Marianne Krasny if you, um, yeah, I don't know if you, you know her, but her, her email's on the Civic Ecology Lab page and, you know, they might have some stuff as well. Uh, sounds like we've uh yeah I'm I'm supposed to, yeah I'm supposed to be facilitating and there's awkward silence and I'm not entirely sure what to do. With <laughs> um, Carolyn, this is why I'm grateful for people like you because I am bad at facilitating and 
sometimes in formal conversations make me nervous for this reason. So <laughs> taking on his team today. If I might, I, w I want to make a plug to all our everyone here, the, the the thing of actually promoting the clean network itself and the opportunities of it. I maybe we're getting odds or shakes of heads. That, uh, you know, I'm I'm noticing whether it be in organizations or or people that in climate action and climate education, most people are around for a few years, or you know they come in, they have a grant, they do things. Some are here for 10, 20 years, right? But the idea is that there's there's always someone new coming up. There's other organization, and to make sure that they know they should be in the clean network, they should be here. They need to hide out. And like like the folks at Livermore, they didn't know about the clean network. And I was kind of like, what? <laughs> you know, because they had done their research and but they didn't know about the clean network. And you need to you need to be part of this. And they were amazed when they found it out. It's like, hey, when you need and for clean, when you need resources to teach in school. My God, if you're not going starting up with clean, you're starting from scratch. Why are you doing that, right? Anyway, it just you know people, the organizations come come up, but we need to bring them in. So. We do a featured, we have featured clean resource in our our teacher newsletter uh, that we send out. But, so there's, but, always, yeah. there's always something in there linking to, you know, linking to the overall clean network. But I think Jim Jim's raising a slightly different point um, that the and we you know Tamara and lots of us in the clean network of, of on the network side not the collection which is you know back when we had the collection the network and and you know we tried to like clean up our clean issues um, so that's why the portal the collection and the network but. But one thing that we know is that like the clean network is really good at certain things, but it is not everything. Um, and there are other networks that are parallel, adjacent, aligned. But one thing we've not really gotten a very good handle on is the, you know, Tamara, we spent some time on network of networks, right? And tried to how to how to architect the network of networks. Um, as opposed to, you know, just our network itself, right? And and you know, clean is more of a network and network approach than it is a network. It's it's kind of both. But you know, what's what's what are we doing and what are these other adjacent efforts doing? And what we know often is that there's very, you know, as somebody comes in, they don't know that all these other activities, right? SciStarter. That's that's its own thing, and then the federal crowdsourcing for citizen science, and then then and then and then and then and then and then, right? Um, but you know, we just we know we're under invested in in the network of networking um, and building that coherent understanding of the field, especially as it grows and changes and and morphs. Um, that's one of our biggest gaps that we have not closed in the time we've been together. We've grown the network, the clean network. And it's robust and people come in and out. Sometimes they go out and in and out and in, you know, that's cool too. But um, I, I think you're you're naming a, a, a bigger point, Jim, that uh, clean is just a piece of that architecture. But uh, what I've seen in my 17 years at this is that there's the, the space that we're operating in is blooming, which makes it really hard to navigate and operate skillfully uh, because of that, that, that organic uh, dynamism. And would we say that one of the characteristics of who we're looking at is often their their organizations, initiatives, networks that are more general than us, right? They might be general STEM. I, you know, one of my favorites is the STEM festivals, right? The science festivals that are very that, that cover all kinds of subjects, but they love to have things on climate change. Right. Earth Day events love to have that. And we're kind of the specialists. We're the people who do that. And I, I found that people recognize that that's a good mix. Right. It's not like, well, why should we work with clean? We we cover it. It's no, you all are doing fantastic on climate change, which is one of our hottest issues. It's one of our most important things. So it's kind of that thing of, you know, I guess what we have with AGU, too. It's the thing of both AGU is a very general science one, and that can be that has its ups and downsides to it, but it's important that we're there. And I, I think we continue to be one of the most lively parts of all of AGU, not just in education, but in the science side and on the youth side. So.
So in that vein, um, you know, what, what can we be doing in order to foster this network of networks kind of situation? And like, you know, we can identify that there is a lack there. So maybe we could take the last five minutes or so to sort of think about, yeah, how to, how to reach across various aisles and, you know, sort of make that happen. Actually, I'm going to invite Tamara. Um, remember when we were doing Clean Core, that no would pick up the funding for a clean collection and the clean portal and some support of the clean network. But we always knew that that was what, what clean was funded when it was originally NSF. Yeah. came down on an annual basis to NOAA. And we said, well, clean core is what NOAA will cover. And then there's all these activities that we knew were beyond clean core, beyond what I can fund. Mm -hmm. um, we've known about, but we've never been able to really marshal resources against. Um, we've been, a I mean, you're right, Frank. We've not been able to get specific resources. How, uh, however, as Frank mentioned, this network of networks, all of you represent that those app, those networks out there that are doing a lot of these activities. So no, we've not specifically gotten funding for a lot of these efforts, but uh, you could probably identify many of the efforts we described in those, in those, uh, um, those uh, larger efforts beyond Clean Core and the efforts that all of you and our colleagues and the rest of the Clean Network are involved with. Would, would one thing, one, there's probably 20, 50 things, but one thing is pay a little more, can we pay more attention to the Climate Ambassadors Program? Because I'm learning, I think we only have one ambassador in California from what I understand. We've got a big state here and I, you know, I'd love to, um, anyway, if we can have more people, as I can guarantee you, we have plenty of opportunities for those ambassadors to get out there. That's not an that's not an anybody's somebody screwed up. That's just a maybe collectively we could pay pay more attention to that. You know, because a I lot think, of people, I, uh, I think that 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 kind of thing is hard. And I have an example that you could potentially use as a model. I'm involved with Climate Interactives and Roads Climate Ambassadors. Um, I went through their training. I'm listed on their website. That community, they truly support that community. They have over 550 En-ROADS climate ambassadors worldwide. Um, you find, you can actually ask, uh, people can say that they wanna have somebody to facilitate a climate solutions workshop for them. They can go online, they can, they can put in what language they want it, uh, in, they can search what state or what country they're in. And, they actually have meetups of NROS climate ambassadors via Zoom every quarter so that we can be in contact with each other. And what the outcomes of this, a couple of high school students at a, high, at, at a school here in Massachusetts emailed me to, to facilitate a workshop for them. And how did they get my name? I happened to be on a list that somebody, one of the students went to an event at MIT and I, my name was on a list and they contacted me. Cold, no teacher involved here. I ended up asking them, I said, I can't show up at your school without a teacher knowing I'm coming. Um, and so a teacher did get involved And this Sunday, I did run such an event for them. So it's not a matter of just collectively being aware of the ambassadors, but really supporting them to the extent that they become a community. I mean, I had people contact me and said, I need somebody to facilitate in Spanish. And I happen to know an ambassador in South America who's done over 300 of these and does it in Spanish. So um, those kinds of connections, it, it just takes a commitment of an organization. And Frank, as we talked about that overarching support structure, that's the kind of thing that Climate Interactive is doing for these ambassadors, but what it's doing for them is by, they also have us register all the events that we've run. So that by showing their funders that the, the, that the, the materials they're developing are being used worldwide, um, ensures their future funding. So it's in their interest to do this, but it does take, I mean, they have staff members who that's their job is maintaining that community. So that's an example out there, but it's just not, you just can't do it and say, you wanna collectively be aware of the ambassadors. There's, there's gotta be something that you actually 
help them do and support them in doing moving forward, whether that's helping people use the clean collection more or helping helping um, people develop um, teaching materials from the clean collection resources. Whatever it is, it has to be identified in a way that is a product that others want and that you can facilitate this group of ambassadors to help provide that service. And, it, it, and I can tell you that sometimes, I would say the vast majority of times, I don't get paid for doing these events, but every once in a while I do get paid. So, um, and, and that's independent of, I mean, let's say for example, if the clean network, the, the, the group in Colorado, were to manage this. I'm not saying they should, I'm just saying that for example, um, what the, basically the way it works for me is that if I end up getting paid for using their materials, because um, their materials are completely free, then I actually donate 10% of what I earn to Climate Interactive to help support their effort. So it's not a lot of money, but it's, it's my way of, of recognizing that I didn't develop the resources and supporting the organization that's helping me reach out to large numbers of people. And I have done about 70 of these workshops over the past few years. So, and I'm just one of 550 plus people doing this. Thanks, Tamara. Carolyn, are we, are we, uh, it looks like we're at time. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're at time. Um, thank you all so much for your contributions. Um, I sent the, uh, yeah, I put, I put a whole bunch of links in the chat. Um, I guess I'll give everyone a minute if you wanted to like save the chat for, um, to grab those, but I'm good. I don't have anything else uh, to add other than what y'all have put on the table. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for making this uh, easier on me. <laughs> and I will see you next week. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, everyone, thank for you. a good discussion. Bye. Thanks.